Uh, hi. Um, so in case you don't know me, but you do know me, but you don't know me, uh, my name is Rami Ismail. I'm one half of Dutch independent studio Vlambeer. We're the creators of games such as Super Crate Box, Ridiculous Fishing, Love Trousers, and we're currently working on a game called Nuclear Throne, which is available on Steam Early Access for $12.99. Please go buy it. Thank you. Um, I was uh, asked to do a talk here uh, two days ago, uh, which didn't give me a lot of time to prepare. But I saw Sergi's talk uh, this morning, and it was about the indie apocalypse, about the end of the world for all of us indies. And um, I want to talk about that. Let me check my, uh, my watch so that I know how much time I have to talk to you all. Good. So today, my talk is about how to survive your first indie game for dummies. Um, that's basically what I want to talk about. Can I just for a quick quick hand count, how many of you are currently students or working on their first game? Pretty much all of you, that's awesome. Hi, welcome, thank you for coming out. Uh, you're exactly the people I want to talk to. Um, so here's the thing that I noticed. A lot of talks that we tend to listen to are about success. And I want to talk about failure. Uh, very specifically, I want to talk about your failure. So. Um, if that is something you do not want to listen to, uh, this is the point to get up, leave the hall. There's two exits on both sides. Nobody? Good. So, how to survive your first indie game? The large majority of indie game studios do not survive their first indie game. Okay? In fact, it's very likely that your very first indie game is going to be a massive failure. And that your amazing indie game studio is not going to work out. Now honestly, that could have also been true for my game studio. When I started in 2010, I had no idea what I was doing. I was dropping out of the school that was giving me, like, that was supposedly going to, like, give me a paper at the end of it. And I started a company with a guy I really didn't like because he was the only other person dropping out of school. That is the full story of how Vlambeer started. There's no smart story there, there's nothing clever. The logo, the name, you know how we found those? It's a drawing that somebody did in a notebook. We don't even know who made the, draw, the drawing. We have no idea. If somebody comes up now and sues us, we're screwed. <laughs> we presume they were drunk though, so it's probably fine. So, Vlambeer could have could have not worked out, but it did. And that's not just thanks to me, it's thanks to a lot of things. We made Super Crate Box, which was a game purely about mechanics, in a time where everybody really cared about mechanics. So that was pretty cool. Uh, and then we did a Flash game in a time where people still paid money for Flash games, which was also really cool. And then we got picked up by a publisher in Texas who just, managed, who just happened to like ridiculous game about shooting fish with machine guns, which randomly happened to be the game we made. Now, we also made a lot of right choices. We also thought about things, we also considered things, but the honest reality is there are many moments in our history where it could have just been over for Vlambeer. And it wasn't. Now, that doesn't mean you should not try. If you're a student and you want to become an independent developer, you should try. You should just also understand that it's very likely that you're going to fail. Okay? Okay. I made this photo. It's a good photo. It has a pretty good composition, good light. It's a pretty good subject. I'm not going to make money with this photo. Um, it's not a great photo, which presumably it could have been. I have a lot of friends who shout at me for taking photos too quickly and not properly setting up my aperture, not properly setting up my camera, not putting it on a tri like a tripod. Like, I don't care. I don't make photos for that reason. It's not a photo with a subject that's relevant. I'm not a professional. I'm not promoting myself as a professional photographer. Yidong Louis made this photo. It's a much better photo. Has a lovely composition, has a good light, I think it has a great feeling of tension, like with the foreground and the background. Yidong Louis will also not make money with this photo, uh, because Yidong uh, shared it with a Creative Commons license on 500 pixels, which is a photo sharing website. 
But Yidong is a much better photographer than I am. Um, they very likely spent a lot of time perfecting this craft, even though they're not going to make money. Joe Rosenthal made this photo. It's a photo taken at the planting of the US flag at the Iwo Jima at the end of a just this enormous fight during World War II. And you probably know this photo. You've probably seen this photo. Is there anybody here who had never seen this photo before? You've all seen this photo. You've seen this photo. Photo. It's, fun fact, it's the only photo that ever won a Pulitzer Prize in the same year the photo was taken. And it is very often presumed to be the single most recognizable photo in the history of mankind. Joe Rosenthal, who made this photo, estimates that he earned about $4,200 in direct earnings, about $1,000 in prize money, and about $700 in, t in interviews. So if you add those up, that's not a lot of money for the most recognizable photo in the history of mankind. Now, of course, you might be thinking, this is 1945, this is a while ago, so there's inflation, you know, that amount of money was worth a lot more back then, and it was. If you adjust for inflation, it's worth about $132,000. It's a lot more, but still, that's the single most recognizable photo in the history of mankind, and it didn't even earn him 200 grand. So, basically, there's bad news. The bad news is, indie games is like photography. More people have access to game development and game design than ever before. Tens of thousands of people around the world are making indie games today. I've visited a lot of them. I've flown to about 220 places, according to my Google location history, in which people are making indie games. I went specifically to those places to talk to people that make indie games. There's tens of thousands of them around the world. And there's not a lot of them that earn money. And those that do, do not earn very, very much, if any at all. And only a very, very little amount, very little percentage of the people that make money make enough money to make a living. Now, you've presumably heard about the indie apocalypse and the end of indie and everything is getting harder and it's not abnormal. Like, the stories that we've been told over the years are success stories. It's the stories of the people who made it. It's the indie game, the movie stories. It's the stories of the people that became famous or visible or rich, and it's called survival shit bias. You probably all heard of the term somewhere, uh, but even though you've heard of it, you have this bias. There's no way around it. I have that bias. Everybody has that bias. But the reality is, being an independent developer has always been and will always be a very hard thing. And all that talk about the indie apocalypse, whether it's gotten harder doesn't really matter. What really matters is that you really, really understand that being an independent developer is hard and that very likely you're going to fail. Can you read this? Okay, there's a lot of words here. Um, there is a little circle in the left that says mental model. Can you find that? Okay. From there, this graph goes all the way. This graph was made by Raf Koster. And in his words, it is an oversimplified model of what a game's feedback loop is. Raf, for those of you who don't know him, is the creator of Ultima Online. He was the creative director for Star Wars Galaxies. And he was writer of a wonderful book you should probably all read called A Theory of Fun for Game Design. Raf is a far better and more experienced game designer than you are. And Raf is currently an independent developer. He has a way better chance of getting attention than you do. David Reedon made this. David Reedon announced his new game, The Beginner's Guide, on his Twitter yesterday, exactly two days before he's going to launch it, tomorrow. But Davey, Davey is not just 
any game developer. Davey made the Stanley Parable. Davey has a lot of credibility for his work on the Stanley Parable, and he understands how to play PR far better than you do. And Davey is currently an independent developer. His game has a far better chance of getting attention than your game. Gen Z made this. Gen Z is the art director for Supergiant Games, and she directed the art style for Bastion, which is gorgeous, and for Transistor, which is also gorgeous. And Jen is a widely respected and super acclaimed artist with several successful titles, and she is a better game artist than you. And Jen is currently an independent developer. Her art has a better chance of getting attention than yours. Lucas Pope made this. Lucas is the creator and the programmer of an indie hit called Papers, Please. Have you played Papers, Please? You should play Papers, Please. Lucas moved on to a new project. It's called Oberdin, which is a highly anticipated game, and he self-imposed the style of him on himself that is one bit. He can only use these two colors. Lucas made this, and he currently works as an independent developer. And he has a better chance of getting attention than you. Now, you're only seeing our successes again. I'm only talking about the success cases, right? There are thousands and thousands of developers that are not, not quite as good as you are, right? And even the people that I just named, even the people that I just listed, we've made mistakes. And it's true. I made mistakes. I once messed up a negotiation that cost of $30,000. I once failed to market a game, allowing another studio to steal it and make a million dollars. That was our million dollars. And then it wasn't, because I messed up. But you don't have to worry too much about failing. You should actually probably just set yourself up for failure. Because honestly, it's probably going to happen anyway. But it's important to make sure that you can fail, that you're in a place where you can fail. So I want you, for your first indie game, to adjust your goals. I want you to prepare for failure. It is going to fail. But I want you to create for success. I want you to create a thing that you are proud of a thing that you stand behind, a thing that if it becomes successful, you can be proud of. And most importantly, I want you to build a space for your own work. And what that means is I want you to make a thing and start talking about it and start gathering people around you that like it, that like it because of the thoughts you have, that like it because of the art style, that like it for any reason. I want you to make that space because that space is important to you. But even then, honestly, you don't stand a chance. But again, that doesn't mean you should give up. You can make this work. It is possible. Although you should probably not quit your day job. Keep your day job. Now, I have prepared for all of you individualized feedback. So who of you here is working on a game right now? Just raise your hand. It's OK. I'm not going to bite. I'm not that scary, I hope. OK. So I have some feedback for all of you that just raised your hand. You don't know enough. You think you do. Uh, we actually have a name for this. It's called the Dunning-Kruger curve. Have you ever heard of it? It looks like this. It's a curve that describes how people who learn something misinterpret how much they know. So you start in the bottom left. You know nothing, but you know you know nothing. When you first pick up an instrument, that's the feeling you get, where you're like, how the hell am I supposed to hold a guitar? Which side is up? Am I holding it backwards? Then you start to play your first song, and you learn your first song, and it's some shitty, like, 10 year ago, like rock ballad thing 
that really is quite simple to play, but it's the first thing you learn. So you're really, really proud. And you think you can play everything. Because all you need to do is follow the things you did before, before that other song. And then that other song is really, really hard. And your music teacher tells you, you're going to need more technique for that. That's not good. It's not good enough. He will say, oh, go fuck yourself. I know what I'm doing. I play guitar. I've played a song before. Who do you, who do you think you are? Now, that part is that first big curve up until the C. We have a name for that. It's overconfidence. It's arrogance. It's thinking you know what you're doing. A lot of people call that first thing Mount Stupid. <laughs> now, at some point, you realize that honestly, you, you don't know shit. And that's where the interesting stuff happens. Because you fall. And suddenly you realize, oh my god, I know nothing. I know nothing about game design. I know nothing about playing guitar. I know nothing. There are all these people making these models. Raf Goster's model of a game feedback loop. Have you ever seen anything like it? The first time I saw it, I just sat there in awe. And I was like, how does a human mind come up with this? And then I read his book. And then I still didn't really get it, but you know, it was better. I felt smarter. I don't know where in the curve I am, but I'm somewhere. Now, then the curve falls under the red line that is where you know as much as you really do, and you know that you know that much. Now, that part we call imposter syndrome. And it's a feeling that a lot of you are also going to have. It's a feeling that you are a fraud, and everybody is better at this than you, but nobody has figured it out. And the honest truth is, all of you feel that way. You just don't talk about it because it makes you feel kind of weird. But you all do. If you don't, you're probably still before the C. Because after you hit D, you know that you don't know. You know that there's much left to learn. And if you still have the arrogance to think that you know, you just haven't passed over Mount Stupid yet. That's fine. Because you will. Because as you keep practicing, you will. Now, eventually, that comes back up. So here's my guess. If most of you are students, this is where I can find you. Now, I'm not calling you stupid. I'm not saying you're on Mount Stupid. I'm not trying to make any value judgment. I'm just saying that if you have never released a commercial video game before, and the thing you want to do is make commercial video games, there is no way that you have passed this point. Because there is so much to learn. And the biggest problem you're going to face is that you don't know what you don't know. You have no idea of the amount of information that is still out there that you know nothing about. So let's talk about budgets. Your budget is too small. What is your budget? Who's making a game? You, what's your budget? <laughs> Which one is larger? <laughs> yeah, see? Um, still too small. Somebody else? Sure. Zero. Zero. Yeah, that's also too small. Um, have you ever figured out what a booth at an event costs? Like, let's take PAX, Penny Arcade Expo, one of the nice events. How much do you think a booth, booth costs you? Yeah, you know it. That's not fair. Somebody else? Make a guess. 6,000? How much? 30,000. It can be 30,000. It can start at about four grand, and it goes up from there. If you calculate six, pretty good. Um, I've seen a booth that was half a million. It was Minecraft. Um, they burned it down after the show, apparently. Um, what's your burn rate? Does anybody know what a burn rate is? It's how much you spend per month. But it's how much you spend per month without incidentals. So just your salaries, your office, your licenses, everything you have to pay every month. That's your burn rate. Flying Bear has a burn rate of about, I, I would say, like eight to $12,000. That's just salaries, licenses, upkeep, office, websites, servers, stuff like that. That's what we need per month. We're just two people. But then I'm not counting our freelancers. 
And we have a lot of freelancers, but they're not the burn rate, because I can get rid of them. Sorry. <laughs> now, speaking of getting rid of people, your team is too big. Like, for every person you add to your team, you're going to add a full salary. You know how many students I've met that made a really cool game, but they have eight people? You know what happens? They fail. And they don't fail in an interesting way. They don't learn. They just run out of money because paying eight people is a lot of money. I was in Sweden the other day and this really cool team won the Swedish Game Award for Best Student Game. And they were eight people. The next day they were in a talk of mine and I asked them to stand up. I said, all eight of you stand up. And I said, after this talk is over, I want there to be four left. And that sounds cruel, but I just saved four people. The other four people, give them a good deal. Tell them that if the game does well, you give them a revenue share. But there's no way you're going to finish your game with eight people. Maybe you might finish it, but it won't be a company, because you won't be able to sustain it. Speaking of things that are too big, your game is too big. Our industry is full of people that are terrible at scoping and scheduling. If a programmer tells you that something will cost two weeks, don't trust them. <laughs> Programmers are terrible at estimating how much time something is going to cost. In fact, everybody in our industry is somehow completely incompetent when it comes to estimating anything. And I don't know why, but if you are going to go on that long, long road to success, with your minuscule, like your tiny, tiny chances, make a small game. Make something that costs six months, four months, maybe eight months, but not more than that. Because that way you can fail more often. And that's good. Your game, bitch, it's terrible. Honestly. Who here is making a game? Nobody, all of a sudden? <laughs> See, that's how bad your pitch is. It's so bad that when somebody asks you to, thanks. Um, when somebody asks you to talk about your game and to give me your pitch, you're already embarrassed by it. That's a bad pitch. When somebody is on here, somebody is anywhere, and they ask you to pitch your game, you should be able to pitch your game. You should be able to pitch it straight away. If I wake you up by throwing this glass of water in your face at some like 2 a.m. at night or something, I go, pitch your game. You should be able to do that, because maybe I have a big bag of money in the back of my truck, and I'm just like, I need to spend this money somewhere. Might as well be a video. What do you, what do you have to pitch? It's like. I'm not going to give you that money, I can tell you that. And if you do a pitch, don't tell me it's some action zombie survival platformer. You know why you shouldn't tell me that? Because I still don't know what the name of your game is right now. I can't Google for action zombie platform survival. That gives me like 14,000 results, and all of them are Steam Greenlight games. <laughs> so don't do that. Give me the name of your game. Tell me what platform it is. Tell it why I should be, why, why should I be interested? Why should I give a shit about your game? Should I give a shit about your game? That's how your pitch should be good. Your pitch should be good enough in three sentences that I want to throw money at your game. And if your pitch is not that good, it needs to be better. No pitch is even worse. So you've got work to do. Oh, and your game design sucks too. Sorry, but it's, it's kind of true. Make it better. Do you have any idea what you're making? Like, not just like, do you know what you're making, but do you really know what you're making? If you were here during Daniel's talk just before this, could you follow that? Did that make sense? Is that how much effort you put in your game design? It's just like, it would be cool to make a strategy game. Let's make a strategy game <laughs> with zombies and laser dinosaurs. Should we play test that? No. No, we'll get to that at the end. No, your game design is probably bad. I'm sorry. That's what happens when it's the first thing you make. It's shit. Shit, you could have been working for years in this industry and the average thing you're going to make is still going to be shit, unless you really, really understand it. And 
they have a, they have a good game have a good game design good game design and your business case sucks because you have not even considered what you're going to do beyond sell it who here has a better idea of what they're going to do with their game to earn money than sell it Perfect. That's a good idea. Use it for promotion. Anything else? Sell it is not good enough. Okay, how about go? Something like Humble Bundle could be interesting. If you do it too early, you're going to devaluate your game and it's going to be shit because nobody's going to buy your game anymore until it shows up in a bundle again. If you do it too late, if you do it too late, it's just, you know, you're going to make some money but not that much. Does, does Humble make a lot of money? Does anybody know how much the average person makes when they're in a Humble Bundle? So I would guess that the average game in a bundle makes about 6 to 7% max of what gets made in a bundle. Now if you think about how much a bundle makes, say it makes like a million, how much is that? It's less than the Pulitzer Prize photographer made. And your game art sucks too. Just want to throw that out there. That's not what coherent means. Like, who's your art director? Do you have an art director? Yeah? Are they good? Yeah? Student. Good student? Coherent? Yeah? Would, would, I, would I like the screenshots if I saw them? There are no screenshots. Yeah, that's not a very good art style. Um, <laughs> Oh, and speaking of which, your audio sucks too. I mean, Incomptech, great website. Love Kevin MacLeod and all of his free audio music things that you can download in a nice searchable database. Music is great. Don't get me wrong. He does great work. But it doesn't fit your game. You can't just download dubstep <laughs> and add it to your game. Or like cool techno rhythm. Or like emotional violence 3.mp3. That's not how it works. Yeah, it might work if you knew what you were doing, but are you a musician? Some of you are, but the others aren't. And usually, they're the people making the choices about the music. Why? Because, fuck if I know, people just want to make choices about music because everybody feels they're a genius at music. Turns out that there are people that are actual geniuses at music, and you should probably let them make those choices. And those sound effects? Come on. Have you listened to them? Do you know how important sound effects are? Do you know that a sound effect can literally change the balance of a video game? There's a story about the Wolfenstein versus shooter, and that shooter had two guns on opposite factions that were statistically identical. And still, one of them did way better in the game, and they couldn't figure out why, because they're statistically identical. And you know what turned out? The sound effect of one of them was really, really nice. And it made people play more aggressively. So they got more points. The sound effects on the other one, it's like, that's not a gun. You can't kill people with that. That's a thing you like swat flies with or something, if even. So people didn't use the gun. They ran away. They were less, they were less aggressive. And your marketing sucks. Remember the screenshots? I mean, screenshots would be great. Oh, your trailer. Who of you have a trailer? Who of you have a good trailer? <laughs> One person kept their hand up. Is it good? Are you sure? You like to think so. That's not good enough. You need to know so because your money, your life is going to depend on that. Oh, and your self-care sucks? Do you know how hard it is to release an indie game? Have you been through like the really, really deep, dark parts of being anxious? Because your game sucks, and you know it, but nobody else seems to. You're the only one that realizes your game is bad. And people are going to buy it, and they're going to hate it. And it's all going to come back to you. And then the first review comes in, and it's a negative one. Have you ever felt that? Are you ready for that? Can you deal for your first review that isn't good? Can you deal with a Metacritic score of 33 for a game that you've worked on for so long? Can you deal with, like, are you really ready for that? 
Do you have a social network? Like, do you have a social support network? Do you have friends that you can talk to? Have you abandoned all your friends because you wanted to make games? Don't do that. Making games is hard. It takes energy. It takes, it takes emotional energy. You're going to be exhausted emotionally. And if you don't have people to fall back on, you're in trouble. And you're making something that you really, really care about. But on the flip side, you're also trying to earn money. There's tension there, and it sucks. That tension sucks. And you're going to have to learn to deal with it. Are you ready for that? Have you ever thought about that? Or is this just a school project, a student project, a thing that you need to deliver for a grade? Because I can tell you, the stress of school, I don't want to say there's no stress in school, because holy shit, school is stressful. Okay? I know what they do at schools, and I'm glad I'm done. But they do it for the right reasons, because that is nothing. It gets worse. Your communication sucks, too. Words are hard, Joe. Have you ever tried them? You've tried them, but have you ever thought about them? Have you ever thought about words? Like, properly thought about words? About how messed up it is that we make sounds and then I hope that in your brain it means, means the same as it does in mine? Like, I, I used to do this, this exercise with students where I told them, make me a platformer. You get 20 minutes, 20 minutes to ask me any question you want. I'm not going to do that now because I don't have 20 minutes. But they would ask questions like, what does it look like? I'm like, it looks like a platformer. Okay, what do you do? Well, you get to the flag at the end of the level. How do you get there? Well, you, you walk and you jump. How do you do that? Arrow keys, jump button. Are there enemies? Yes, there's enemies. How do, how do, can you defeat them? Yeah, you jump on top of them. Yeah, are there special types? Running? Yeah, absolutely. Are there power-ups? Yeah, they are in blocks. Okay? You, you have a game in your head? Yeah? Is it, Super, is it Mario 64? Yeah? How many of you actually had Mario 64? How many of you had Super Mario Bros? How many of you had something else? How the fuck did you end up with something else? I have no fucking idea how I did that. <laughs> Turns out that like 10 of you had 64 and 20 or 30 of you had Bros? Didn't we all agree that we were talking about the same game? Because I'm pretty sure all of you thought that you had the right game. Uh, unless you know that I'm kind of the kind of asshole that will pull this kind of trick on you. In which case, you probably predicted that. That's how fallible words are. And you use that. You do that. You make that mistake every day. You talk to people, and they think A, and you think B, but you both think you think the opposite thing. And now it's an agreement, but it's not an agreement, and you haven't talked about it. You know why contracts exist? Because our communication sucks. We're fucking terrible at it. You know why game design documents exist? Because we're really bad at talking. You know what's better than a game design document? A prototype. You know what's better than describing a piece of art in words? Drawing it. If you suck at drawing, draw a thing and then put an arrow with the word cow or something next to it. If you're trying to draw a cow, that's what I do when I have to draw a cow. I'm terrible at drawing. If I want to communicate with my audio designers, I just go, no, I want the sound to be more like <laughs> Unless I, I don't like that. Can you fix that? Because now we're talking in a language that is non-ambiguous. You can't mess that up. But we keep going back to words. Don't do that. Bad idea. I say as a writer walks into the room. Great. Um, speaking of which, your plans are way too positive. You won't make a million dollars and PewDiePie won't play your fucking game. Seriously. And, and you don't think enough? I, I'm sorry, but do you even know what you're doing? Do you, do you have like a strategy, a vision? Who of you has a vision for what they're going to do? What the fuck is a vision? Seriously, what is a vision? What does that even mean? It's a word. It means nothing. Do you see publishers and indies as separate things, as like opposing things? Who here sees them as opposing things? Like opportunities. Who's, who here? Who here? Who here? thinks Xbox is better. That's one person. 
Who here thinks PlayStation is better? Okay. It doesn't fucking matter what you think. Make games for them. Who gives a shit what is better? You're running a business for fuck's sake. Do you think VR will be an opportunity? Of course it is. It's a new thing. There's nobody there. People are starting to figure out that you could be there. Are you making a VR game? There's one person that is, and they're really happy right now. It's a good idea. It's a much better idea than making a platform zombie apocalyptic shooter thing. Good, well done, wow. That's almost worth an applause, almost. All right, go for it. Just Good sell. Allows me to drink some water. Hey, uh, do you all follow the news? Gaming news? Like really, really well? How many people visited TwitchCon? Do you know? 20,000. What is SAG AFTRA? Voice Union. Perfect. Uh, what publisher made Grow Home? Ubisoft Canada. Perfect. Did everybody know that? No? Um, what did Hofbrick just do? Fired all of their designers. Also, they hired a new CMO. Do you know what a CMO is? Chief Marketing Officer. If you didn't know the answer to all of these questions, why aren't you reading the news? It's the news about your work. This is literally the industry you're going to work in. Like, Gamma Sutra, GameIndustry.biz, should that be at the top of your thing? Why? Because job offers will be there as well. When Halfbrick eventually de decides that firing all of their designers might have been a bad idea, there's going to be a lot of job openings for designers there. So now what? Now, here's, here's, here's very good news. Talks are bullshit. Don't listen to me. Seriously. Talks are not truths. They're perspective. Keep in mind, somebody is talking to you from a perspective. I'm talking to you from my perspective. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have to fix your shit. Fix your shit. Because I'm not telling you this because I just wanted to waste your time with 30 minutes of bullshit. All of this is true. All of the stuff I mentioned sucks, sucks. I need to fix it. Because if you don't, you're going to be one of those green light games that I mentioned. And you don't want to be one of those green light games. You really don't. You want to be the games that go through green light, not the ones that get stuck in green light. And then, you know what? Try your shit. Like, I said PewDiePie was not going to work. Who the fuck am I? It might work. Email PewDiePie. Why not? Who here has email PewDiePie? You did well. You did well. You did well. Did it work? You guys did well as well. Did it work? It worked? No? 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 See? It worked for somebody. What? Didn't sell anything. Well, that's shit out of luck. Uh, but email him anyway. For some people, it does work. Now, the main thing I'm trying to say is you have to survive anyway. Everything sucks. Everything is terrible. The indie apocalypse is here. We're all doomed. Back up your stuff. Go home. This is all worthless, but it's not. Just try to survive that first one, really. And while you're trying to survive that first one, try to get as much as possible out of it. If you can get money, get money. Enough to run a company? No, of course not. It's your first thing. Are you kidding me? Get some press. Every person that writes about your game is a press contact. If they want to reach PewDiePie the next time, they're going to have a much better chance. If they're going to try PewDiePie the next time, even though PewDiePie didn't respond to their email this time, they're still going to have a much better chance. Because they already tried once. They kind of know what doesn't work. So don't do that. I don't have your answers. I know a lot of you came here to listen to somebody tell you how to survive your first indie games. I'm a dude that woke up one day and had a company whose logo is literally a bear on fire and whose name is a bat pun on the word flambeira. That is my life. That is who I am. I'm Rami from Flambeer. I love the logo, but that's kind of weird. And I did a lot of work, and I had a bunch of luck, and I, I did a lot of, like, long nights of work, and I made some right calls, but I don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. Anybody tells you they know? Remember the Mount Stupid? 
Nobody knows. People know what worked for them. Things that I did in 2010 worked in 2010. Things that I did in 2011 worked in 2011. They don't work now. I can't tell you what to do if you're starting in 2015. I'm in a different place. I, I run Vlambeer. I know how to run Vlambeer in 2015. I know how to, how to start in the industry in 2015. You know who knows how to start in the industry in 2015? You. You're the only ones that know. You're the only ones that have to know. So you have to figure this out. I can't. So you have to expect failure and you have to try. I tried. I tried everything. I kept, I kept my day job. I read books. I made games. I went places. I did things and it worked for me. And I sincerely believe that those things can work for you. But what you, what you need to strive for, really what you have to go for is everything. Not just games, everything. You need to know as much as you can. You need to know more about design than RAF. I want you to beat RAF costers at knowledge of game design. I want you to have more credibility than Davey. I want you to be a better artist than Jen. I want you to be more visible than Vlambeer. And it probably won't work. And that's fine. Let's, let's take small steps. Let's try failing with something small. Let's try to make a first game and learn and gain as much as we can and then survive the critical or economical or, or commercial or technical failure that your first game is going to be because it's going to suck. And then you can start on number two with just that little bit more to start with. Thank you.